Manchester, city of kings. A lovely city, and an old one. Even before the Normans came, it had its place in history. For many centuries after, there was a royal residence here. And in the troubled times of the Wars of the Barons, to seize Winchester was as important as to hold London. Like so many old towns, the streets are narrow and full of character. But they're also full of problems for the heavy traffic of today. The West Gate is the only one of the old city gateways still standing. From here, the High Street runs down the hill. 15th century houses shelter behind the city cross. Here it was that kings were proclaimed and sermons were preached to crowds gathered in the open space around. King Alfred, who swept the Danes out of southern England, is still commemorated in the principal city of his realm by this statue. Being merely 50 years old, it's a comparative newcomer to Winchester, as is this early 19th century bridge, which replaces a much older structure. By the bridge stands the old city mill. Its days of grinding corn are over, but it still has a service to render the community. Today, it's a youth hostel. And for the pilgrim who's young in spirit, and as pilgrims should be short of money, there's a warm welcome and a good night's rest here. A royal site for a royal city. The Romans were quick to see the advantages of this rich Itchen Valley with high dry ground served by abundant streams. The great cathedral. Yes, it seems to lie sleeping in the heart of the city. It has no spire or tower to be seen from every quarter. Instead, it stands apart in its green surroundings, quiet and dignified at all times. This is the true start of our pilgrimage. The 14th century West Front. Here is the essential spirit of the art and people of England. The present cathedral, which replaced a Saxon building, was started in 1079 and consecrated in 1093. Much of this Norman building still stands, concealed behind later work. Restoration and repair is continuous. Stone crumples, timber rots. Even the original foundations have proved inadequate after centuries of service, and concrete has been pumped into the subsoil to support the structure. This is the deanery, where Philip of Spain stayed when he came to Winchester to marry Mary Tudor in the cathedral, and in this way, as he thought, gain control of England. Charles II stayed here too while his palace was being built near the town. But Prebendary Ken wouldn't have Nell Gwynne in the house. And the king, preferring the company of his mistress to that of his churchman, left abruptly. To a house nearby, Jane Austen came in 1817 on a short visit to Winchester. And here it was that she spent her last days. And from the cathedral precincts, College Street leads towards Winchester College. It was William of Wickham who rebuilt much of the cathedral and who founded Winchester College and the sister foundation of New College, Oxford. The gateway and other parts of his original buildings are still in use here. Built in the 14th century, they are among the oldest school buildings in England. Carved on one of the walls is an inscription 
phrased with old world charm and medieval piety, learn, leave, or be licked. Here, on the site of the ancient castle, Judge Jeffreys peened his bloody assize after the collapse of Monmouth's ill-fated rebellion. Dame Lyle, the elderly widow of one of Cromwell's soldiers, was found guilty of harboring two fugitives and was sentenced to be burnt alive. But her influential friends were able to have this savage sentence modified to one of mere execution. Just outside Winchester stands the oldest almshouse in England, the Hospital of St. Cross, founded in 1136 for the care of 13 poor men, feeble and so reduced in strength that they can hardly or with difficulty support themselves without aid. Here, the traveler can still claim the wayfarer's dole of bread and small beer. The present inmates don't seem to be quite as feeble and reduced in strength as the founder intended, but then nobody would grudge them their declining years in these peaceful surroundings. Now, from this cathedral city of calm dignity, we start along the 150 miles of roadway and field path that lead to Canterbury. The name Pilgrim's Way was an 18th century invention. Pilgrims probably used it sometimes on their way from the shrine of St. Swithin at Winchester to that of St. Thomas at Canterbury. But long before the pilgrims, the way was there, one of the great prehistoric routes across England. Here's the attractive little church at Martyr Worthy. And through this village, many people consider the way runs. But then there's no end to the arguments as to the authentic route. But whichever one you decide upon, the Hampshire villages offer a wealth of picturesque corners of thatched roofs, moss-grown tiles, warm brick walls, and grey stone churches. Alsford is the first small town we come to. It was a Puritan town during the Civil Wars and was burned by the Royalist troops. In those days, it was often unsafe to walk in the streets. Today, things are quite different. in Chawton. At the rectory, Jane Austen lived and wrote the greater part of the six novels that have imperishably preserved the manners of her time and her much-loved name. And so the road winds on, where medieval travelers slept hedge and ditch. And if they were true and devout pilgrims, made a cheerful noise with their handbells. And what better spot in the 13th or the 20th century for a wayside meal? But more and more, the materialistic world of metal roads and unseen traffic are consuming the countryside. These green paths and ancient ways have escaped so far. But there is need for unceasing vigilance by all those who love England if this beautiful country is not to be submerged in the endless, ugly, untidy litter of subtopia to become a vast junk heap of bad buildings, road signs, hoardings and pylons.
In the good old days, even the great had their difficulties. The Duke of Norfolk, while staying at Farnham Castle, spoke of marrying Mary, Queen of Scots. Queen Elizabeth told him very sharply to be careful on what pillow he laid his head, a remark which one feels had an edge to it. The castle, much restored, is now the residence of the Bishop of Guildford and a retreat for the clergy. But the shell keep and much of the old work still remain. Solid, time-worn masonry, scarred by battles of long ago and by the unwearying elements. The shell keep is a fine early Norman example. From a high point on the ruins, we can see the way leading on towards Canterbury. Generally, the route lies on the summit or southern slopes of the downs, only occasionally coming down onto the lower lying lands where the path would be impassable in winter. But it is seldom far from a village where the traveller may break off and spend the night. Occasionally, the old road and the new meet, as at this bridge surmounted by a pilgrim's cross, where the main arterial road pays tribute to the older route passing beneath it. Seal, like its neighbour villages, nestles snugly in this Sare Valley on the southern slope of the Hog's Back, around a little old world 13th century church. The Pilgrim's Way runs right through the village, through Puttenham to Compton, whose church was mentioned in the Doomsday Book and which contains many relics of the Saxons. Compton also contains a memorial chapel to the Victorian painter G. F. Watts, and a memorial gallery of his work. In the village itself, the modern traveller is attracted by the timeless elements of rural life. Quiet of Compton to the bustle of Guildford, the county town of Surrey. The 17th century Guild Hall swings its bracket clock over the roadway. Guildford is full of inns, many of them centuries old, and among the finest buildings in the town. The one whose liquor Samuel Pepys recommended has given way to a chemist's shop. Somewhere, someone still sells the right brew. The Hospital of the Blessed Trinity shows a characteristic red brick facade. All Guildford needs to make it a fine city is a cathedral. And this it will have when the work started in 1936, but suspended during the war is completed. The chancel and transepts are in use, and work on the nave goes forward. Stones from Canterbury and Winchester are buried beneath the foundations of this 20th century cathedral, which stands midway between them. When the work is completed, Guildford will have its modern cathedral to match its ruined Norman castle. The days of the barons' wars and civil wars are forgotten. Only the calm and mellowed remains look down on the inhabitants of today. The way passes close by the town, though not through it. 
It runs down past the ruined chapel of St. Catherine, perched on a low sandstone hill. And across Shalford Meadows, where Shalford Fair was held. This, by the way, may have been the original vanity fair of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And on to Shalford itself, which crosses the River Way. April the 17th, 1955, a pilgrimage greater than any it had seen before moved through Guildford. 20,000 people of high and low degree passed through the narrow streets and out to the cathedral on the hill. In an address, the Bishop of Guildford said, our pilgrimage marks a new stage in the building of our cathedral. Much has been done inside in the last two years. Now we are coming outside, and we long to see the nave finished in the next year or two. But the pilgrimage is not merely an occasion in the business of building the cathedral. As we go up the hill to God's house, so we direct our wills to the doing of God's will. We shall one day dedicate our cathedral to his service. So on this day, we dedicate ourselves once again to the same cause, to proclaim his kingdom and glory to the world. hill, set in these beautiful Surrey woodlands, lies the Imperial War Grave Cemetery at Brookwood, where sleep the comrades in arms of the free world. Men of all the services and of all the allies lie here side by side. Newark Priory, once the foundation of the Austin Canons, but now nothing but a picturesque ruin. Nearby, the idle wheel of Newark Mill turns in the river way. But not far from this haven of peace, the main Portsmouth Road confronts the traveller. Too many cars, far too many cars. for the Surrey Constabulary.
This stretch of road has its niche in history. A few months back, and even today, cars traveling along here had their windscreens mysteriously shattered. Police and scientists alike were puzzled. They couldn't find an explanation. Might it be the sound barrier? Or the atom bomb? Or could it be... What do you blame him? From here, our way runs through beautiful country to Albury Down. Albury's silent pool is said to be haunted. King John, and nobody says good of him, is reputed to have surprised the miller's daughter bathing. Legend has it that she let go the branch she was holding and drowned. But I hope the story had a happier ending. From the quiet serenity of Albury, a few miles along the main road brings us to Shear. As with so many villages along the way, the pride of Shear is the church. The porch was rebuilt in 1636, and the food and drink for the celebration cost 30 shillings, enough in the money of that time to ensure a very festive atmosphere. No? Nobody knows why it's called Friday Street. But a young lad can still get some free fishing here about. Us. Avenger Hammer was once a center of the iron industry. And if the trade hadn't gone north to the coal, Abinger Hammer might have been like Sheffield today. Dorking is famous for fowls, large white snails, and water sushi, a form of freshwater fish stew. There's great argument as to which of these old Dorking inns was Dickens Marquis of Granby, where old Sam Weller told his son of the trials of being married to a sharp-tempered widow. But what does it matter which one it was? They're snug little pubs, all of them. Burford's stepping stones carries across the River Mole. Time ever mellow these modern concrete blocks as it did the old stone ones. Castle Mill, also on the mole, carries us across into Kent, still one of the loveliest counties in England, though London is fast eating into it. But down here, along the line of the downs, there is still profusion of orchard, sheepfold, and hop garden. A few years back, this was Bomb Alley, the route for Hitler's bombers and V1s on their way to London. But all the time, the land and the stock had to be tended. The immemorial life of the farm went forward. For 400 years, the Kentish orchards have held their high reputation. You should 
come to Kent when the apple blossom is out, or when the cherries are ripe on the trees. Or if your interests are more specialized, when the hops are being gathered. Hops came in with the Reformation in the early 16th century. And since then, the hop gardens of Kent have given distinctive flavor to English beer. They've also given working holidays to London's East Enders, who move out in their thousands every year to go hopping. When they return to the Great Smoke after their few weeks in the open, they leave the vines torn down and stripped, and the hops drying in the oast house. Yost houses to the brewery, and from the brewery to you. Well, we've come a long way, far enough to give anyone a thirst. In the valley of the Silver Darrenth are the ruins of Otford Castle. A nightingale once disturbed St. Thomas's devotion here, and a blacksmith once misshod his horse. Now they say nightingales never sing and blacksmiths never flourish in Oxford. But other crafts keep going here, as in most rural areas. Though it's a little sad that there are no young men in the trade. Chillum, the last village before Canterbury. Unspoiled and likely to stay so. It lies on the line of the Pilgrim's Way, but up a steep hill from the main road. Little traffic disturbs its peaceful green. Long may it remain so. Many of the houses round the green are timber framed and show the weathered beauty of their oak beams, cut from the forests of the Weald more than 400 years ago. The oak blackens with age and shows up the bright whiteness of plaster work, making the typical half-timbered house so characteristic of England's countryside. Within sight of Canterbury, a white cross cut in chalk of the hillside marks the point where our way joins the road taken by the most famous of all pilgrims, the characters of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. From St. Martin's Church on the Hill, they too must have looked down many hundreds of years ago through slight morning mist on this inspiring view of Canterbury. As in Winchester, here at Canterbury too, only the West Gate remains. The Falstaff Inn, ready to welcome us, as it has welcomed tens of thousands of others since it first opened its doors in 1403. Every part of Canterbury is brimming with history. The Greyfriars. In 1224, five little brethren of St. Francis were lodged in a garden and later built their friary. The House of Agnes, which tradition associates with the love story of David Copperfield and Agnes. Dickens had it in mind when he described Mr. Wickfield's very old house bulging out over the road. The Sun Inn, as it now is, where David found Mr. Micawber waiting for something to turn up. These old houses are still called the Weavers, after the Huguenot and Wallen refugees 
who settled here when they were driven out of France and the Netherlands by religious persecution. They brought to England their skill in weaving silk and fine fabrics and started a new industry in Canterbury. Through the arched gateway of St. Augustine's Abbey, we catch a glimpse of the cathedral towers rising up over the city wall. Butchery Street has an ugly name and an ugly history. It was a favorite lurking place for thugs. Today, it's as peaceable as you could ask. The only butchery now is practiced on prime Scotch beef. So, through the narrow old market street of Mercery Lane, where the fronts of the houses lean out across the road until they nearly meet, to the end of our pilgrimage. The Cathedral Church of Christ at Canterbury, the place of martyrdom of Archbishop Thomas Becket. And specially from every shire's end of England, to Canterbury they went. So it was in Chaucer's day. So it is today. So may it ever be.